Thanks a lot, uh, Dian, for the introduction, and thank you all the participants to join in for this session, which is, of course, a more specialized session, particularly looking at uh, insurance uh, as a sector. Uh, on the side of uh, the insurance sector, in, sen in sense, the commercial insurance or the general insurance. Uh, more particularly, again, for uh, business interruptions and the claims coming out of the uh, the pandemic and the lockdown that we are facing. We will not uh, focus much on the healthcare and insurance, at least as part of today's session, uh, to, to make sure we are focused on one topic and we try and cover that fully. So uh, your comments, questions, if they are in reference to that would be very helpful. And you can put your questions in the Q&A window and we'll and answer that as we go along. Uh, thank you, Richard, uh, Hena, and Juhi to join this session. I think this is uh, one very, very important aspect which is going to be the fallout of the uh, pandemic that we are facing. Uh, we are yet not out, particularly India has going through its what they call its lockdown 4.0 and still uh, you know we are in a zone uh, where we are not clear as to how long this lockdown should be strictly enforced and whether lockdown uh, has any direct connection or correlation uh, to the cases because uh, while we had the lockdown for more than two months the cases are still increasing uh one way to look at it is that they are not bad uh to the extent it could be uh, we are still able to restrict them but uh, what had what it has resulted into is complete lockdown of all the businesses unlike other countries uh just to give you a perspective uh you know that uh, except very few essential uh services uh almost everything uh, was under strict lockdown for the first two or three lockdowns and most of it is still continuing in the fourth lockdown which means not only the businesses like restaurants or uh, you know filmmaking or uh, uh, film distribution theaters malls but even uh, other businesses which uh, could have continued with a little bit of social distancing or otherwise were also forcibly uh, you know uh, locked uh, in terms of the uh, directives of the uh, government so there will be several claims now why india would be little different than other countries i think unlike the earlier epidemics as as we may call it let's say sars or ebola or similar India didn't face many situations of claims out of those uh, issues. And therefore, neither we have a lot of practical experience, neither a lot of jurisprudence around it as to how the claims under the standard policies which businesses take uh, would be uh, you know, exercised or claims would be accepted or rejected. Uh, two, even during the downturn in 2008-9, some of the business interruptions or losses, India in a sense was insulated to a lot larger extent. And therefore we even don't have, uh, if not for pandemic, but for uh, you know global downturn, we don't have that kind of an experience yet. You will also see that even government today has not focused on this part a lot. We'll, we'll touch upon that as to what India has taken as measures to you know give guidance on these issues and why they are not adequate uh, as we go forward. But the point I'm trying to make is that it is now even more important for India to understand how internationally some of these issues have been dealt in the past. And therefore, one, we can learn from it, two, uh, we can improvise and also not make you know similar mistakes. Uh, because uh, those kind of issues have not happened in the past. Even our policies as uh, negotiated by the businesses also do not cover in particular some of those situations. 
Now, there are always wide wordings as to what is covered in the policies and even wider wordings as to what are the exclusions, and we'll talk about that in, in detail. But with that background, we thought that it would be very, very important to hear from, you know, Richard, Hena, and Juhi, at least their international experience, knowing uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, your involvement in, in insurance sector, and particularly, Richard, uh, we would be very, very uh you know happy to hear your thoughts and also guidance as to what uh, measures india can take uh, both the government and the business side so with that uh, introduction may i request Duhi to give a little perspective uh on the uh, you know history or, or the past impact of similar health crisis or epidemics and how you know that has been dealt with and how that would be different in this scenario and you know what is their experience uh, related to you know some of the insurance claims that they have seen uh, in the recent times uh, over to you Julie. cool thank you so much vyapak and uh, also thanks a lot for having us here today uh, we are very happy uh, to share our understanding and experiences on this topic from this part of the world and also look forward to uh, understanding some of the developments in India, as you mentioned, as we go along this webinar. Uh, as I would start by highlighting uh, that COVID-19 is the seventh pandemic or epidemic of the 21st century, uh, some of which you listed. We had SARS, the H1N1 flu, and the avian flu, which went around the world. And then there were some uh, localized infections, such as MERS, Ebola, and Zika. And why it's important to mention some of these past health crises is, or specifically SARS, is because the roots of some of the contentions that are today arising between the insurers and the insured lie there. So economically, uh, SARS was the most devastating of all these outbreaks. It spread to some 37 countries around the world. And it's estimated that in the 15 to 18 months that the virus was with us, it caused losses to the tune of about $54 billion to the global economy. But today, when we look at what's happening with COVID-19, these figures pale into complete insignificance. Uh, the virus has spread to more than 200 countries in less than six months and is forecasted to cause a 3% contraction to the global economy this year. Uh, I read up an example of China where it's estimated that uh, the service sector there alone lost some $68 billion in just one quarter. And this is even added the impact of uh, the loss to the GDP as a result of activities coming to a complete standstill in the manufacturing sector or the construction sector, which are the lifeline of that economy. Uh, so the numbers are grim uh, and uh, they're probably likely to become even bigger for as long as there is no vaccine or cure, uh, the lockdown or the restrictions continue and the recovery is pushed back further and further. And so what's happening in the meantime, uh, businesses around the world are turning to the insurance sector for helping with their survival and financial restitution. So during this webinar, we will uh, explore how both the insurance companies and the insured are navigating through the crisis triggered by COVID-19. I'll start with what's happening with the insurance sector. So the insurers and the reinsurers learned a very costly lesson from SARS in 2002, 2003. In Hong Kong, some $42 million were paid out towards business interruption uh, claims and losses. And what happened thereafter is that insurers started adding specific exclusions for bacterial or uh, viral outbreaks to the insurance coverage to limit their future losses. And the situation today is that no matter where you may be in the world, a standard business interruption policy would exclude epidemics and mostly cover property damage resulting from events such as a fire or a natural catastrophe. And while uh, some insurers did design and market uh, specialized products to provide coverage for infectious diseases, the uptakes in general been very low. And What's still interesting is that Lloyd's of London uh, estimates that the 2020 underwriting losses uh, covered by the insurance sector globally 
as a result of COVID-19 are likely to touch $107 billion this year. Uh, so, uh, Richard, given the sheer breadth and expanse of, or the scale of this pandemic, uh, can you please share, say, on the basis of your interaction with clients, how is COVID-19 impacting insurance companies? And uh, more than anything else, how is this time any different from any of the health crises, natural disasters, or even the terrorist events that we've seen in the past? Yeah, thank you, Julie. And um, thank you, everybody, actually. I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you. I mean, as you might imagine, I mean, EY is a global corporation, so we've been having many, many client conversations. And that's with policyholder clients, but also with clients who are insurers and reinsurers. And, and we'll talk about some of the challenges that face policyholders a bit later on. But I do think it's important first to understand some of the issues that are facing the insurance sector, because this is really setting the context for how the insurance sector is responding to claims. And there are there are three main challenges. I mean, there are lots of challenges, but there are three principal ones that I think are facing the insurance sector as a result of the pandemic this time round. And I'll talk about each of these briefly. So firstly, sizing their potential exposure to claims. The second is solvency related issues. How could the exposures give rise to sol solvency issues? And thirdly, how to deal with the regulatory pressures that are arising out of the pandemic? So sizing the potential exposure to claims, and we've, we've already been engaged by one insurer to help them with this problem. So I, I can say from experience, this is proving to be far more complex than normal. Um, and that's really down to the widespread impact of the pandemic, but also to the, uh, the wide variety of insurance products that may be called on to provide cover. Now, whether that's legitimately called on to provide cover or Illegit or illegitimately, it doesn't matter. You still need to work out what your exposures are. I mean, added to this, one of the other complications of the insurance and reinsurance industry is that policies aren't always sold directly, but quite often they're sold by um, through other channels, by brokers, by through delegated authorities, and the wordings can change depending on how um, those policies are sold and on negotiations between specific policyholders and insurers which simply means that many insurers and reinsurers do not really have full visibility or complete information about which products have been sold and exactly what cover is in place that may or may not respond. So then secondly, dealing with the potential impacts on solvency. I think prior to the pandemic, insurance margins generally were under pressure due to the, the place we were in in the insurance cycle and pricing pressures on premiums but also we've got low investment returns across across the globe um, and insurers often make money from investing you know the premium income that they take so insurers now are therefore very concerned about the added pressure that any large scale exposure will place on their profitability <clears throat> and hence on their solvency so i mean generally it's not really expected that any or even many insurance companies will fail but we've already seen examples of insurance companies seeking new capital. So why are these two things important? I think these two factors and the insurance industry's general position that it never underwrote or intended to underwrite such wide scale financial losses that are being experienced now as a result of the pandemic. So, it, it, so, so that really leads them into the general approach of denying claims unless it's very, very clear cut that the insurer wrote specific pandemic cover. And what all this is leading on to is the third, and I think this is probably the newest and different challenge that's facing many insurers, which is how to deal with their regulators. So insurance and reinsurance regulated industries, they always have to deal with regulators. But the regulatory action in the light of the pandemic in certain countries has been different than before. And a good example of this is in the London market in particular, but we've also seen it in other jurisdictions. And this is driven by the regulators need to ensure that the market operates properly and that policyholders are treated fairly. 
and the scale of the pandemic and its financial impact has created social and political pressure on the insurance industry to support businesses and to help economies get back moving, but only where cover exists and should respond. Although some governments are pushing, and I think the US states and the courts, I mean, they often push for insurers to pay even where it's dubious as to whether there will be cover. So we, say, so we have seen regulators take a special interest in COVID-19, and we're seeing regulatory intervention that is different to previous health crises. And predominantly, this is doing two things. One, it's directing the insurance sector to resolve disputes around coverage and whether it exists, and to really speed up payments to companies where there are warranted payments. What they don't want is valid cover uh, or valid claims being held up in disputes over coverage. They want money getting into the economies. And then the second piece is that we've actually seen regulators begin to intervene through the courts to obtain clarification of whether policies will need to respond to COVID-19. And I think that is, is really to try and circumvent the delay in, in individual action groups. And Hannah will say a little bit more about that later. That's all I had to say on that one. So uh, thanks a lot. And uh, maybe uh, uh, I'll, I'll bring in a little more Indian perspective and at least from a regulatory perspective, how India has reacted to it. So Ashish, do you want to just give a little brief on uh, what kind of uh, measures the Indian insurance regulators have taken? What are the current policies or practices which government has uh, announced post the pandemic? Uh, and whether they have adequately responded to what is required for the current business environment. Sorry, I was on mute, <laughs> the usual problem. Yeah, so firstly, good afternoon and thank you, Vyapak, for that. And uh, as Richard was pointing out earlier, uh, that generally there are certain jurisdictions where the regulators are pushing the insurers, at least in those situations where the policies are ambiguous to step in and provide uh, coverage, or at least that's the intent, to see how uh, insurers can come in and help out businesses who are facing these difficulties. I think the Indian regulators also take a similar approach, but uh, considering it's India and the insurance market in India is not so sophisticated, and the nature of the country and what's been the priorities for the government, uh, the IRDI, that is the regulatory authority for insurance in India, uh, the steps that they have taken have largely been focused on the health and life insurance side, as opposed to non-health or life insurance uh, sort of policies. So you have the government coming in and the insure now a number of insurers launching the ROK Sanjeevni policy, which is essentially a low-cost insurance to cover health insurance and medical insurance for uh, the poor people generally within India. So the government measures at least have been focused on uh, the this side. Uh, on the non-health or uh, life uh, insurance policy side, there's not been many measures or things which have been taken by the government. Uh, there is the General Insurance Council in India, which has come out at least with one sort of uh, clarity, which is uh, relating to uh, typical uh, property insurances which are there in relation to business uh, in India, normally known as the fire and standard peril or other perils policy and similar other policies. Uh, these policies typically have a clause which says that if a property remains unoccupied for a 30-day period, then the coverage within these policies uh, lapse to that extent. Now, obviously, because of this pandemic type uh, situation and the consequent lockdown in India, uh, businesses and properties have remained unoccupied. Uh, and, and those uh, places, premises have remained unoccupied which could have consequently led to a lapse of these policies. Now, at least to this extent, the Insurance Council has stepped in and provided clarity and said that uh, they will give a sort of a relaxation till at least till 3rd of May. Now, post 3rd of May, again, there is no clarity of what needs to be done and probably businesses will have to take steps to ensure that within their existing policies, whether they need to notify insurers regarding this uh, non-use or non-occupation, of their premises to ensure coverage within those policies. But this still only deals with whether the existing policies continue or do not continue. 
this does not really go into the aspect of whether the losses which are being caused to businesses due to this ongoing lockdown are actually covered within these policies or not. And to that extent, the regulators have been silent. The insurers have also come out and the general statements which have been seen in the market or in the news, at least from the insurers, are that they are not covered within the policies which are there in India. Now, in India, at least in terms of business interruption, which is our focus for today's discussion, uh, business interruption claims are generally or pol policies which cover business interruption claims are generally coming in as an add on to the existing fire and standard perils policy or as part of an industrial all risk policy. Those are the two types of places where typically business losses or due to such uh, interruptions are get covered. But again, there there are certain issues which as we go on in the session, we will discuss. But at least on a larger perspective, uh, the, there are not many measures which have been taken by the regulatory authority and uh, there are not many policies under which these claims can also be made within the, India as such. Sure. Thanks, Ashish. Uh, Juhi, you want to take it forward from here in terms of uh, yeah. the other points that you want to cover? Yeah. Thanks, Kapak. So uh, thanks, Ashish. Uh, I think ambiguity is, the, is, is something that probably runs across the uh, globe on the, some of these matters right now. So and uh, resulting that there is this um, huge expectation gap that is we are now seeing between the insured and the insurers. Uh, as Richard alluded to earlier, at a broad level, that gap uh, is basically about the role insurance sector is expected to play to support businesses or economies in this times of crisis. But at the more transactional level, which I guess the audience is more interested in, uh, the gap relates to issues around policy coverage and exclusions. Uh, so, Richard, could you please help us understand that what are the various policy wordings or exclusions that are now proving to be contentious? And also, uh, maybe from your advisory work, share some examples of what you've seen happening in the market currently? Yeah, certainly. So, um, I think, I mean, from, from what we're seeing, there are several different policy types and triggers um, that we're seeing that may give coverage for COVID-19. And I'll talk about the business interruption policies um, that Ashish just referred to, because they're, they're similar um, elsewhere in the world to, to India. So quite often the business interruption um, is a an extension or part of the sort of industrial or risk, general or risk policy, but it is a it is generally an add-on to your standard perils, fire, flood, and those sorts of things. And of course, what what generally happens is, and in fact, for most business interruption policies, it is a requirement that in order to have cover under the business interruption, you have cover under a material damage policy. So the general general business interruption policy for it to respond typically requires there to be property damage of a type that is insured under the under the main property policy and so there's generally no real expectation that those policies will respond and provide cover although there is a there is a debate and it's it was it's been it's being tested through the courts in the US and it's a debate that's going on certainly in the London market is whether um, an infection at a business premises of, or as a result of COVID-19, so spores of COVID-19 causing the closure of a premises, whether that would actually constitute physical damage for the purposes of the property operation. I'm not gonna spend very long on that because it's very wording specific. But even if it does provide cover, the losses that will be covered will be very will be very small and for a very limited duration in time, because it doesn't take very long to clean up these premises. And and in any event, the spore, the life of the spore isn't isn't that long. So those can be resolved very quickly. Where there may arguably be cover though is is through extensions to business interruption policies, and particularly we've seen extensions that that cover financial losses that are non-property related. So they don't require there to be damage to the property and they're designed to cover uh, pure financial losses. And the specific wording in the policy again needs to be um, considered 
<clears throat> but where we have seen some policies giving cover is around specifically, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and just amalgamate the various different things into one, one specific example. So the closure of the insured premises, business premises, as a result of the order by a public authority or a government, as a result of an outbreak, and the word outbreak is quite interesting because it that's the word that's often used in the policies that we've seen, of a notifiable human infectious disease. So you would expect um, here where, where this cover exists, for COVID-19, it's definitely a human disease, it's, it's infectious, it's notifiable now, and it's given rise to the closure of many businesses. So therefore, it appears that many people may have cover if they have that extension. But having said that, coverage here is subject to exclusions and it's subject to disputes over interpretation. So some policies will contain a specific list of diseases that are covered. So it will say we'll cover you for diseases, but then it will list them. The challenge with that, and you have to go to the small print or the definitions quite often for this, is that COVID-19 is a new strain of the virus. Therefore, it isn't included in the list of diseases in policies. But quite often, there won't be a specific list and therefore there'll be wider coverage available. So if you've got that wider coverage available, there's then the issue, particularly if you go back to the wording of it needed to be a notifiable human disease, um, as to whether this is one of the notifiable human diseases, and if it was, when was it listed? So for COVID-19, different jurisdictions have listed it as a notifiable disease, and there are different wordings around how it's been listed. Um, so at different times. So this will impact things like how you quantify the claim because you may have had impact on your business caused by COVID-19 that was not, that happened at a time when COVID-19 wasn't listed as a notifiable disease. And then the government notifies it, puts it on the list. The policy then may cover that, but you'll only be covered from for losses incurred from that point on. Um, and then the other thing we're seeing is, and I talked about an, an outbreak of the disease in, in policy coverage, and there may be restrictions around where the outbreak occurred. Some policies require the outbreak to be actually at the insured premises, whereas others require it to be uh, in the close vicinity of the premises. And we've seen in that respect, we've seen policies with a one mile, two mile, 25 mile radius limit in them. But we have also seen policies where there are no such requirements. So, and that's probably down to loose wording by the insurers, um, but there are no limits. So it's just what looks like wide open cover for any outbreak anywhere. And so the issue that is really beginning to emerge around coverage there is, is a pandemic different to an outbreak? And of course, the insurance position is the insurer position is well, of course it is. We were only intending to write underwrite little outbreaks, not big. But even some policies will have epidemic cover in them. And the insurance industry, there's a debate about whether a pandemic is different to an epidemic. And so we're seeing debates around the, the different public health responses that you get to that. So even where it appears that cover may exist due to ambiguous or loose policy wording. Um, there is another issue that really arising, which is fundamentally at the time of underwriting, uh, was it the intention of insurers to underwrite wide scale losses of this nature? Um, and one of the questions that's coming out there, and we've seen with some insureds where they have been specifically offered a pandemic cover, quite low limits and quite expensive. And they've, they've declined that cover because it's expensive and doesn't give them much cover. It's very difficult if you've been offered a product to cover pandemic and declined it to then argue that your policy wording um, that is ambiguous covers pandemic. So those are the sorts of debates that are coming up around business interruption. I think the, the, other, the other piece here is that we do expect other policies will be picking up some of these COVID-19 losses. Um, there are things like events cancellation, 
policies, particularly in the um, hospitality and the media, sports and media sec uh, sectors, where people put on big events. Those are the sorts of things where they might have bought specific cancellation insurance, which again might provide cover. But the other sorts we are expecting to see, or insurers are worried about, should I say, employers' liability claims, as as companies work out what they've done with their with their workforce, but how they bring them back to work safely. Um, credit insurance is another area where, um, after the global financial crisis, the credit default swaps were a big issue. A lot of the underwriting of trade finance has moved into the insurance sector. Uh, so if companies begin to fail, uh, insurers may be picking up indirectly the results of uh, the impact of COVID-19. And then there are directors and officers, DNO policies and ENO policies. And I think the uh, just on the DNO, where I think people are concerned is that decisions that businesses are making now will be challenged and questioned. <clears throat> whether it's around improper trading, whether it's around recapitalizing businesses at a time and maybe presenting inappropriate financial forecasts or information. So we don't, we're expect, that's an area of concern. Um, we haven't seen anything much there, but it is something that the insurers are, are looking at. So with all that said, um, I, I mean, I, I think hopefully that illustrates why we are expecting a lot of contested claims and a lot of litigation coming out of this area. And I'm just going to pass over to Hannah now, who's going to say a few words on what we are also already seeing around litigation um, in the UK. So over to you, Hannah. Thanks, Richard. So having discussed the reasons for disputes, we're now just going to take a quick look at how they're coming to life in the market. And there's a perfect example that we've seen this week. Um, it was announced earlier that AXA will be paying for a number of BI claims from French restaurants. And this is following um, a court ruling in Paris last week that found in favour of the restaurant owner. And this was despite AXA arguing that its policy did not provide coverage. So this ruling could really be seen to strengthen the case of policyholders all around the world. And it would definitely be of particular interest to um, a number of action groups in the UK. So in the last few weeks, we've seen um, a number of action groups formed. Um, they've been pulled together on behalf of the policyholders. And these policyholders have seen their insurance coverage denied um, on the basis that their business interruption is, is solely attributable to COVID-19. These action groups are facilitated by law firms and we're seeing at the moment that they are seeking lit litigation funding or have already managed to acquire it. And with that, they'll be able to push forward with their, with their, um, with their groups. So, We've also seen um, a response from the Financial Conduct Authority, and this is the regulatory body that's responsible for the conduct of financial services firms in the UK. So that includes insurance firms, and they're looking to push a test case through the High Courts in July this year. So it's coming up quite quickly, and they hope that through this they'll be able to um, provide some clarity and and resolve some of the contractual uncertainty that there that there is um, around business interruption at the moment. And the way they're doing this, they've invited insurers and brokers and policyholders as well to submit um, their policy information and to get involved. and And the results and the judgment of this will actually be um, legally binding. So. We could see that this sets precedence across the London market and um, the outcome will affect the action groups. Um, either we'll see that their issues could be resolved and they won't push forward any further. Or um, if the judgment is not in their favour, we could see that they start to pick faults, um, find faults, sorry, with the judgment and, and push forward with their with their proceedings. So. As I mentioned earlier, um, in relation to this court ruling in France, it really is possible that these early judgments are going to set precedents for similar circumstances all around the world. So thank you, Via. Via sure. Back to you. Sure. Thanks, Hannah, for for that. Uh, and I think uh, we would be uh, reading the judgment uh, which you referred uh, with more interest now because I think we definitely don't have anything in the past in terms of the jurisprudence, neither. 
these cases have already gone to court in India. So that would be something uh, a very important aspect for guiding how Indian courts will also look at it. But you touched upon a couple of topics and maybe Ashish, if I can bring you first in on that, and then maybe I can touch upon the issues related to the uh, past jurisprudence in India and gaps in the Indian law. Uh, I think uh, uh, Richard uh, talked about the DNO insurance and uh, then Hena also talked about the litigation funding. Uh, maybe if you want to give a little snapshot on where India stands on both aspects and particularly in light of these issues, how do you see that growing uh, and what are the you know, do's and don'ts, which you would prefer uh, the businesses to, you know, uh, invite. Sure, sure, Rapak. So uh, probably uh, taking them in order, as you said, first, uh, with regard to DNO insurance. Now, as Richard pointed out, and very rightly and correctly, and importantly for that matter, uh, that businesses, the decisions that they are taking today, and the intensity and speed with which they have been called to make these decisions, the circumstances in which they are being called to make these decisions, and the likely decline in market, and therefore the possibility of these decisions being questioned also being high, is a hotbed or is likely to cause a lot of actions being initiated against the people who are taking these decisions. Therefore, for those who are making these decisions, it becomes very important to also consider uh, their sort of coverage under the policies and that sense brings us to DNO insurance. So uh, we, and the, this is, there have been a lot of studies which have been going around on this aspect and people are foreseeing that it's likely that the frauds may go up, which are being taking, which are taking place. So directors have to be more vigilant as in when they sit on those boards. Uh, to ensure that if any decisions are taking, taken, which are which are there, uh, they are uh, kosher in that sense. But if tomorrow an action is initiated against them, then the DNO policy will come in and trigger. Uh, in that sense, the one important part is that part people should be aware of is notification, uh, or when those notifications are to be made under those policies. And this is typically where we find in our past experience that people miss out. So it one, it is important to have those DNO policies on ongoing basis. And two, it is important that those policies are reviewed and your general counsels and senior people who are there in the company taking those decisions, take note of those policies and realize as and when information is required to be given under those policies. So that's an, on the DNO side of it. Uh, and coming down to the other part, which Hannah spoke about, and she cited that there are funders who have funded these actions in other jurisdictions and are taking those up to see whether those claims can be, uh, can be insurers can be called upon to pay on those claims. Now, it is, it is very understandable to see litigation funders funding actions against insurers because clearly it's a solvent party, which upon a successful action is likely to end up paying those monies, which the, uh, which which are basically ordered by the court as a consequence of these proceedings. Uh, but in context of India, uh, the situation may be slightly different. Uh, and the reasons are, are this, that first, uh, class actions are not that common in India. So to see uh, there be a class action proceedings against the insurers, which then get funded by a litigation funder, it's something that we still have to see and which will happen or not happen. I mean, obviously can't discount it, but it's not that common. Two, uh, in India, we have a very strong regulator in that sense, in terms of powers, not, I not, can't say whether it's an active or a non-active regulator, but we can definitely say that they have a strong, we have a strong regulator in that sense who comes in. So uh, that, that may be a route which may be adopted. And three, because obviously new scenarios like this and hard facts like this lead to precedents being set and new positions being taken but still due to the lack of developed jurisprudence for fund it would be funders will typically find it aggressive to fund these type of claims so your general funders depending upon who your funder is you'll probably have to look for an aggressive funder and find an aggressive funder to fund your claim in india having said that i won't discount the possibility in fact 
funding insurance claims is something that funders actively look for and seek. Uh, we are seeing a growth of this market in India as well, and I had funders reaching out and talking to me about potential claims in this regard. And therefore, probably our discussion will go back when we discuss with these issues with funders on the merits of these claims. And I think that's where probably we have to again bring you back in that how strong do you think these claims are? And therefore, how likely will the funder come and say yes? Sure. No, uh, thanks, Ashish. And um, maybe very quick 30 second on that because we want to also cover one very important aspect on quantification itself, uh, assuming uh, that you are, you are at least winning on the uh, merits. And in Indian perspective, as as you as everyone knows, I think, uh, and Ashish also mentioned earlier, uh, there is uh, very little help in the current policy regime because the two uh, standard policies that people try and cover business interruptions, the industrial all risk policy and the standard fire special peril policy uh, usually presupposes physical damage of property and the consequent business interruption. And therefore, uh, unless uh, you are able to show uh, physical damage, which is obviously difficult in the current scenario, uh, your, your claims are going to be you know, weak uh, so far as those policies are concerned. There are some other exclusions in terms of uh, uh, force majeure or otherwise, but more importantly, we have seen standard clauses uh, where uh, you know uh, any governmental action taken uh, pursuant to which any such suspension or interruption of business arises. Uh, that kind of language is not specifically put into these clauses. Now, whether that can help or somebody may read it more wider in terms of uh, the other exclusions is yet to be seen. And I'll come back on this aspect uh, in a little while. But uh, if you want to first uh, look at the aspects on quantifications, because I think uh, with your experience and expertise, I think it would be important for one to even look at quantification first, uh, because that may be a decision making, uh, you know, a matrix that whether you can even claim in spite of winning or losing on your merits, and what is the kind of claims you can put in such scenarios. So thanks, Vapak, and absolutely right. I think the general advice to most insured would be that uh, you do need to assess the potential value of your claim before you start pursuing any kind of uh, legal action. Uh, so we will uh, talk a bit about the quantification of losses to be covered by uh, the insurance policies. Uh, so COVID-19 uh, produced an unprecedented and simultaneous mix of complications now that would need to be dealt with when dealing with quantification whether it be the impact of the lockdown, the disruption of the supply chains, uh, social distancing, staggered return to normalcy, government support schemes, et cetera. And obviously there is the whole massive financial crisis that uh, uh, COVID-19 triggered. So as you said, assuming your business is covered for pandemics, a question to deal with is that with the quantification of the BI claim, be an exercise similar to that in the past, or are there likely to be new challenges or complications that the insurer, the insured need to brace for? And uh, Richard, would you please uh, lean in on this with some examples, maybe? Yeah, I'm happy to. And I think the, th the point that we're back made around uh, undertaking a commercial assessment of what you've actually lost and think you might be able to recover is very, very important. So in many ways, I mean, step, business interruption policy wording is pretty standard. Uh, certainly there's a London market form and a, and a US market form. There are differences and I'm not going to go into those, but generally speaking, the quantification of business, the way you go about quantifying it will be very similar to the way you would have done it in the past. Um, the policy wordings are generally quite formulaic about how you actually go in about the calculation. And in very simplified terms, there are broadly three key components. One is the calculation of your lost gross profit, and that 
there's some rules about how that's calculated. But essentially what you're doing there is you're looking at the profit that you've made during the period in which you've been impacted, which we call the indemnity period. And you compare that with the equivalent profitability of the business in the corresponding period in the prior 12 months. So if you're impacted from April through to September, you, you would look as your initially as your benchmark period, the April to the um, September in the prior year, and you would compare the two to see how the business had been impacted. But there is an important override to that, which is you need to take last year's figures and then you need to adjust them for trends in the business. And for present purposes, I'll refer to that as the but for scenario, um, which is but for the thing that has impacted my business, you know, what would I have been, what would my business have looked like and how profitable would it be? There are two other components. There's things called increased costs of working, which is the money you spend in order to mitigate and try to avoid a loss of profitability during the indemnity period. And then there's, and, and so you add that to the claim um, and then you deduct from the claim any savings that you've made in fixed costs. So take the example of um, a fire, uh, particularly maybe at a hotel. What you don't do is continue paying all your casual labour, um, full wages, while they're while the, the hotel's closed. You will generally lay them off. You may give them some retention payments, but you will make a saving in fixed costs, and you may save in other overheads. Now, I'm just going to focus on the loss of gross profit, really, because I think this is where um, the, the key differences will come. So, Having said that it's very similar in approach, there are some really important differences which is going to make calculating any claim for losses stemming from COVID-19 far more complicated than it, than it was before. And Julie has mentioned some of them. Two of them are, are heavily interrelated. One is, what is the true cause of a business's losses? And then that has a knock-on impact to your indemnity period. When does your loss start? And then probably more importantly, when does your loss end? So if we take a standard business interruption policy and in the way people have seen it in the past, you know, if you have a fire at a premises, fairly straightforward, you've got a single underlying clause, cause of impact, you know it's covered by the policy, and you know it's giving rise to an impact on the profitability. So it's easy to identify. With COVID-19, there are likely to be multiple causes impacting the business, and they're all at or around the same time. Some of these may be insured, and some may not be insured. So the real complication here is going to be how do you isolate the impact that the insured events have on the business versus the impact of uninsured? So as a simple example, um, talk about social distancing measures and enforced closure by a public authority. So um, in some jurisdictions, social distancing measures were brought in before businesses were closed. As a result of that, or, or warnings to stay at home. So as a result of those, business will have declined before businesses were forced to close. And then it will have declined further as a result of uh, the enforced closure by the public authority. And that's important both for computing the but for scenario, but also for looking at the indemnity period. So if you look at our fire example, um, the indemnity period starts with the fire and it ends when the building's been restored, it's been reopened, and it's back to trading fairly normally. So again, those are all relatively easy to determine. But with COVID-19, you've got some challenges. So you've got the combined effect of social distancing measures and also wide, widespread travel restrictions, which are uninsured. Government enforced uh, closure. Let's assume it's insured here. So as I've said, the start of the indemnity period may be relatively easy to determine. Particularly if, you're, if your policy only covers losses resulting from the enforced closure, then it's only when you closed as a result of that government order that your indemnity period will start. But the question is, when should it end? So what we're seeing is governments allowing businesses to reopen. And the dates of when businesses can reopen 
vary widely by sector <clears throat> but also governments are allowing businesses to open on condition that they meet certain operating restrictions so the business is no longer closed but you may be limited about the number of people that you can i mean if you're a hospitality business or retail you may be limited in how many people you can actually have in your store at any one time so you're going to have an impact on profitability so this creates a challenge with determining the end of the period of the indemnity period now in most policies the end of the indemnity period is is assuming it's less than the maximum indemnity period so policies might say we'll cover you for a maximum of 12 months but um really it's when the business gets back trading to a normalized level of profits and the and what's normal in this context is quite difficult to determine is it the normal as in before any of this COVID-19 related activity happened or do you have to create a new normal based around what the business would have looked like uh, with social distancing measures in place for example had, had the business not been closed so the key debate that's shaping up is is actually around what is the correct but for scenario so businesses will have budgeted for a non-COVID-19 scenario and that's the benchmark that they'll be arguing for as being you know measuring the impact of their business but from the insurer's perspective they'll be arguing social distancing or travel restrictions and their impact on profits are not insured perils and therefore they're likely to want to make a, a significant percentage dis deduction for what we call either loss of general loss of attraction or wide area impact now in this respect there is some jurisprudence coming out of hong kong in relation to the sars epidemic um, as hannah said earlier it may not set legal precedent outside of hong kong but i think it is hugely influential i, I won't go into the detail of the case but it's called new new world harborview hotel uh, if you want to look it up there were a number of key points covered here but one of the key ones that was was one of the key rulings was that the calculation of what they call standard revenue which is your normalized revenue under the policies should take into account the effect that a notifiable disease had on the business if, and in this case the policy trigger was it had to be a notifiable disease and it only became a notifiable disease part way through and the ruling there was that it was only from the date of it becoming notifiable that the insurance responded but you had to reduce your normalized level of, of profitability to reflect the fact that there had been a prior impact on the business so this comes back to the way in which you apply the have the um the adjustments clause sure. so i'll, I'll so, stop there yeah <clears throat> thanks richard i think uh, ultimately the effect of the post period or the post pandemic uh, issues how would that affect the assessment basically what would be what you will you count uh, as part of the you know post event issues and the effect on the valuations so of course that would be something which we would uh, consider from a damages perspective so thanks a lot for that there are one or two questions before we go on a little bit on forward looking and henna i will come back to you on that but there is one interesting question and maybe Richard or Hena, if you know, uh, any comments on Wimbledon holding a pandemic insurance post SARS? That's one of the participants wants to know. And uh, I think uh, uh, that would also show what is the experience for events like IPL in India versus Wimbledon in, in London. Yeah, so I, I can comment briefly on that. So um, post, post SARS, there was obviously um, insurers excluded lots of lots of pan pandemic insurance. Um, Wimbledon did buy pandemic insurance. It's only an it's only anecdotally that I've heard this. I've not seen the policy. I've not been involved, but I, I understand that it was it was kind of offered as a as a bit of an add on. Probably not not that expensive, uh, but they do. I, I understand they do have cover for pandemic. I think they're unlikely to be able to buy that um, post COVID-19 would be my guess. <laughs> so uh, we, we hear that it's almost 140 million 
uh, in terms of the insurance cover. Uh, so maybe they made more profits out of not holding Wimbledon versus holding it. Uh, but uh, uh, that also takes us to the next question. And maybe if I step into the shoes of Julie, but uh, uh, this will also change the policies and coverage, uh, you know, going forward. Uh, Hena, any any your your any thoughts? Like two minute thought before we close the session. So going forward, I think at the moment there's um, insurers are struggling to be able to price uh, pandemic insurance just because of the level of risk that we've seen developed over COVID. It's difficult to predict, and the widespread impact makes them really hard to measure. So. Um, there are a few solutions really um, that we're looking at. So um, within the market, there are discussions uh, going on already. And in the UK, we've seen a steering committee be pulled together um, with leaders some, from some of the largest insurance firms. And these, it's possible that one of the solutions that they could um, be discussing and something that is being discussed actively in the market at the moment is the development of public private partnerships. And these are also referred to as PPP. So, this is the result of um, cooperation between the insurance industry and the government. And um, the PPP would act as a sort of reinsurer. Um, and if it were ever to find itself in a situation where it didn't have enough capital to um, pay for valid business interruption claims that were um, as a result of the pandemic, then they would be financially supported and backed up by the government's treasury. And the benefit of this would be that the financial support that the government provides would allow insurers to continue to provide businesses with pandemic insurance. And it helps to ensure that we're not going to see any sort of cap on how much insurance can be provided. So that means that it should be available to everybody. Um, one example that we've seen in the past um, relates to terrorism. This is um, Pool Re, which was um, it was and is a um, UK-based PPP that was set up in the wake of the IRA bombings in London in the 90s. And we see other examples around the world which address, again, the threat of terrorism and um, natural catastrophes such as hurricanes. So as we move forward, it might schemes are the sort of things that provide businesses around the world with a viable option um, and can increase resilience. Thanks a lot. Before we take a final view from uh, Richard and uh, Juhi, I also see Mishibha, you are there on this call. Uh, if you have any specific point to make. Um, uh, sorry. No, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I just so much but you please carry on i was just going to say very briefly that i, I noticed there are some questions on the uh, on the group chat that we haven't got round to answering and we're quite happy to pick those up um afterwards so no so maybe one or two we can still take uh richard we can continue for a minute or two uh if you are okay uh okay. i think uh, one question is obviously uh specifically asking for the citation of the judgment that you referred Maybe if you can send it to us uh, separately, we can uh, refer it back to the uh, Mr. Divyang Majmudar who has asked for it. Okay. Uh, I think there is uh, one another uh, interesting question. I'll just read it out for you. Uh, just a second. Uh, how serious is DNO issue for an entity which is not listed on stock exchange? I think you did mention about. Uh, some of this uh, challenges uh, on the director's action, but uh, do you think those are more relevant for listed entities or this would be also relevant for non-listed? Well, I, I, I think, I'm sorry, I was just checking, I was off mute. Um, I think it probably depends jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Um, there are, I, I think it will be very relevant for listed companies because they're, they're likely to have um, DNO, and I don't. I think I, I would be reluctant to become a director of a listed company if it didn't have DNO. But I think it is relevant as well to privately held companies, non-listed. Certainly, I can't speak for India, uh, but certainly in places like the US and the UK, where where there is a more litigious world around, and where the insurance industry has been pushing DNO cover for. For some time, and I know 
some of the offshore jurisdictions, Bermuda, places like that, will have DNO coverage in place for their directors and officers. So I think it, you know, it is relevant. I think it's also highly relevant in those jurisdictions where class actions have developed, um, and where litig and where litigation funding is is prevalent. So maybe that's more in the common the common law jurisdictions. Okay, thanks a lot. There are a couple of them. Maybe we'll respond them separately. Uh, we do have their contact details, so we'll we'll write to them separately on the questions. Uh, so thanks a lot, Richard, uh, Juhi, and Hena. I think this was very very helpful uh, and hopefully it was helpful for the participants thank you